Hi, I'm David Booth with the Yosemite Project. Today's webinar is the third in our latest series on the Yosemite Project, whose mission is to achieve semantic interoperability of all structured healthcare information. The Yosemite Project articulates an ambitious roadmap for achieving interoperability. This roadmap is based on the use of RDF as a universal information representation. Using RDF this way, the roadmap involves standardizing our healthcare standards and crowdsourcing data translations. It also calls out the need to incentivize interoperability, since there is no natural business incentive for a healthcare provider to make its data interoperable with its competitors. Today's presentation by Connor Dowling fits into the right-hand portion of the roadmap on data translation. It illustrates how RDF can help us translate and normalize drug data that comes from different data sources and is represented using different standards. Connor Dowling is CTO of CareGraph, which uses semantic web technologies to help healthcare providers gather and analyze the information they create during the course of a patient's care. He is a specialist in clinical data analytics with a focus on how the definition of clinical know-how and institutions shaped the description of patient care. Welcome, Connor. Okay, uh, well, let me, let me start. I'm just gonna share my screen so that we can start talking about it. You should be able to see um, a page from GitHub because I'm gonna start at the beginning and write down in the weeds of how the data itself is, is imported and processed. Normally when I talk about data sets and drug data sets in particular, I get into the particulars of the data itself and the data schemes that are available and who produces them and exactly what sort of information is redundant between different sets and how you end up with a coherent form in the end. Because of the Yosemite emphasis on mechanism and on how RDF helps you integrate a lot of structured data in healthcare, I'm going to start and get more into the plumbing, if you like, of this than I normally would. But I think that's appropriate because of the nature of the Yosemite project. So what you should see in your screen now is the opening page of a Git. So many projects today are on GitHub. And this particular Git is for a simple medical knowledge service. And the idea with the SKS, or simple knowledge service, is that you can take the data sets of structured health metadata from different sources. They're all published by different organizations at different times in different formats, and that's a residue of history. Some data sets go back to the late 1950s when they started. Um, some of them are more recent. They're produced by different organizations, often on for overlapping data. You could argue that we should have a lot less data published, we should have fewer organizations, but it's the nature of these things that organizations rarely go away. So one of the first things you have to do to get coherent uh, health metadata is you're gonna have to reach out and take pieces from different places and bring it into one coherent form. And that's true of drug information, it's true of disorders, it's true of procedures, it's true of lab tests. There's no domain of healthcare where you can get everything you want from just one place. And that the form that it's given in is the form that you actually need. So where RDF came into play for what we had to do was that we wanted a form that wasn't healthcare specific so that we could use tooling and techniques and the best of knowledge representation mechanisms that were out there that weren't necessarily tied to healthcare because though healthcare is a huge area, there's an awful lot of work done in other domains as well. And we have a tendency, unfortunately, in healthcare to think we're oh so special, that we need our own standards for everything, which is one of the reasons we have so many standards. Um, and in many cases, we'd be much better off taking generic standards, widely applicable standards, and putting them to work as much as possible to do any of the tasks we want. And that's where that was the approach we took to representing healthcare knowledge in this open Git. And you see here in the picture on the left-hand side, I don't think you can see my cursor, but you can see on your screen many source forms. Different data sets, OrxNorm is a drug data set produced by NIH that comes in its own format. SPL, structure product labels, contain a lot of information about packagers and patents to do with drugs. 
those are produced by or distributed by the US FDA in a, in a very particular XML format. SNOMED, if people know it, has its own format called RF2. LOINC, you get some of its information from the CSV files um, of the publisher. Other information you get from UMLS and ORF that they've structured LOINC in different ways that's interesting. ICD-9 is CSV. There's various files for ICD-10. So different formats of different folks. Some of this stuff on the left-hand side is released every six months, some yearly. The ATC codes of uh, the WHO, for instance, for drug, drug classes. Um, some of it's issued by by yearly like snowmed some of it every week like the spls from the fda so different schedules different places different formats and so the idea here at the bottom up of the sks was to bring them all into one form and as i said not a form that was healthcare specific but was what we felt the best way to represent this nominally at least diverse knowledge but actually when you bring it into one form you realize it's not that diverse and we chose RDF because it enabled you to readily represent the no, the resources and the fact resources were highly interlinked that underlie knowledge. And in particular, we chose the SCOS uh, ontology because that let us have a standard way to represent a concept. The concepts were equivalent, the concepts of preferred names, and also allowed us to readily model the particular properties of concepts. Now, if I go into, this is in the schemes subdirectory of the Git. If I go in here, you'll see right now, and these are the latest versions of these drug schemes. So it's very relevant to a talk about drugs. Um, this particular Git is the latest versions of the WHO's ATC classes, the orange book from the FDA, which talks about um, the applications and patents associated with drugs. Um, the SPLs, which gets into the packagers of drugs and um, the different dose forms as well. It actually overlaps with some of the other schemes for that. NCIT, which talks about dose forms and that's used in uh, SPLs. NDFRT from the FDA, from the VA, which is the official US way to do drug classes. The official US way is not the WHO drug classes. In fact, NDFRT has two different class schemes. So inside this collection of sets, there is the WHO's drug classes, the two, uh, the FDA drug classes, which is embedded by the uh, VA in NDFRT, and the VA's own drug classes. Oryx Norm, which normalizes all these packagers' names for drugs, so you just have one name for isomeprazole, 10 milligram, even if there's 80 different packagers. And then finally, Unicodes, nearly every one of these guys, and SNOMED does it for disorders too, have their own identifiers for substances. And Unicodes are the FDA's identifiers for substances, and they rely on those when they're describing drugs. Oryx Norm has its own, NDFRT has its own, as I said, SNOMED has its own, MESH has its own. There's an awful lot of redundancy between those schemes. And when you bring them all into one of these GOS representations, a lot of that redundancy jumps out. Now, what it looks like specifically because I think this is a fairly technical audience, we can actually look at something that frighteningly looks like code. This is JSON-LD. And again, we picked the JSON-LD form and not Turtle or some of the others because we could use that in different data stores. And if, actually, if you look at the SKS Git, which you can clone yourself, when you clone, you get all these data sets, um, you would see that this data works in, in Gen of Fuseki. It would work in any triple store. And equally, it also works in MongoDB. So if you wanted to use a document store for processing all of this data, you can use the JSON-LD form of RDF in there. And you can also use it in a more pure triple store. So RDF doesn't mean that you have to choose what some view as more esoteric technologies. You can use much more what are viewed as mainstream technologies with RDF data. But what RDF does, and I'm going to try to show this in this example, is it very clearly brings all this information from different forms. And where there are common means of representation, those are enforced. It also very clearly distinguishes between literal things and pointers. And that's a very important thing when we get into actually processing the information. So very quickly here, and I'm not going to dwell on this very long, you can see that this is a concept. This is a SCOS notion. We've introduced a concept 
into, into the by modeling this particular drug from Oryx Norm as a concept. It has a, a specific identifier, and that's something that RDF is very good at. So you can very quickly identify things uniquely across these different schemes by simply assigning a namespace to each of the schemes. There is a one preferred name, and many alternative names or labels. And these are all standard SCOS notions that we're now enforcing across these schemes, even if originally the schemes themselves had slightly different field names for the same concepts. Most schemes have the notion of a code. Sometimes the code is different than the identifier, so that's why we distinguish those. We're obviously saying we're in a scheme so that we can distinguish this concept from things in other schemes. We have a notion, and this is a notion in SCOS, of top concepts. So the broadest category of thing a concept belongs to, this particular drug is a branded drug, and that's the broadest category we can talk about. And then you get into very specific things like it has a particular, it's the trade name of a more generic drug, it has a component, which happens to be a tw the 20 milligram um, uh, strength of the ingredient it also has an ingredient in form and there's extra information in oryx norm that we can put in as simply boolean assertions it's it is a prescribable thing and it's intended for humans oryx norm also covers animal drugs so this is specifically for humans that definition loaded into mongo or loaded into fuseki gen or another triple store allows us to now process that Oryx norm information. And because we've put all the others, even if their source format was different, into the same JSON-LD form with the same standard properties, it allows us now to do a big reduction so that we can come up with what we want, which is shift out the redundancy and come up with a definitive um, data set of the currently prescribable drugs in the United States. So even with all the layering redundancy in the original schemes, by bringing them into this one form with RDF exposing all the nuance, we don't lose any nuance in that import. We can now then go to the next step. Just before I get to that, I talked about the fact that you can house it in a triple store. We And there's a reference on the Git to say we, we eat our own. So we actually host in a triple store, all of the various schemes and sets. So this happens to be at schemes.caregraph.info. And if I look at the Oryx norm set, which we were just looking at, for instance, this is simply a visualization of what's in that data set that we were just looking at. And you can do exactly the same thing yourself. All this information, as I said, is freely available. So if we looked at that um, Nexium, uh, I think it was 20, this one here, you can see that this is all the data we were just looking at in the JSON-LD. It's simply presented in a nicer fashion. And in fact, behind this, just to show that this is a triple store, we can click and actually look at the native, if you're au okay fait with Sparkle and everything else, you see that there's a triple store behind this with all of this information. And though it starts off as JSON-LD, we can re-represent it in different ways, even as HTML, for instance, which is then clickable so we can run around the various things. You can look at it as turtle, even if it didn't start like that. So one of the other nice things about RDF is when you pick one serialization form, a very nice programmer-friendly one like JSON-LD, if you wanted a purer one, you wanted n triples, you wanted turtle. That's an extremely easy transformation once you bring the data itself into one of these triple stores. So that's where we start. We start by bringing all of the different data we need into SCOS graphs. And in our particular case, in our current pipeline, we actually use Fuseki Jena in order to produce what I'm about to show you. But you could easily do the same process through MongoDB if you wanted to. And what we're doing is we want to produce a coherent data set of just the currently prescribable drugs in the United States. And because we've got all that information in there in a coherent form, we can start doing some reduction. So if you remember, one of the schemes was meta SPL, uh, where these structured product labels, they're actually in the latest release 75,768 of them, which you should see in the pie chart in your screen. <laughs> However, not all of them have an Oryx norm um, index. Not all of them are things that NIH is linked to. We know that because once we have everything in one RDF graph, we can see how many of these identifiers in the FDA data set actually link true to the Oryx norm data set. And it's simply a matter of walking them with Sparkle to see if there's a path between them. 
So we're not going to look at those. Most of those are things, some of them are IVs, where frankly the NIH is a difficulty, but a lot of them are things that um, there's some animal stuff and other things that are not of interest. So of the, of the uh, structure product labels by the FDA, 67%, nearly 70% of them are indexed by Oryx norm in a way that we're actually going to be able to use it. So that's our first reduction. We then start looking at, and actually this is a different angle on the same thing, you can see how many over-the-counter drugs versus prescription drugs are actually indexed. And you can see we've got some homeopathics that's not indexed by Oryx norm. That's something that doesn't interest us anyway, so we're not worried about that. We excluded animal even though it's indexed by Oryx norm. And you can see that not all over the counters are indexed. Now, because we're mainly concerned with prescription drugs, we're more concerned about these missing elements here, and we're actually tracking those issues right now, than we are about these. But ultimately, we want to see why does the NIH set not cover both of these triangles. So one of the things you get when you put everything into one integrated form is you very quickly are able to QA the different data sets. So of the products, of the drugs, the packagers' drugs that the FDA actually uh, has, and if you look up here, the, this is the set that we've actually taken out and indexed by Oryx norm. Of those, some of them, um, there's only one drug product in the label. In some cases, many drug products are in the label. So we're able to look at some basic statistics. This last chart is more relevant, and it gets into when we're, how do you index a drug? And that's one of the big questions when people say drug, what do they mean by it? Do they mean the ingredient? Do they mean warfarin? Or do they mean the ingredient in form? Do they mean warfarin tablet versus warfarin in an IV? Or do they mean the actual strength and dose and, and form? So do they actually mean warfarin 10 milligram oral tablet? What is it they mean when they say drug? In most cases, it's sufficient just to give the ingredient. And in fact, most, um, most drugs, as we'll see in a minute, are actually only available in one form anyway. Um, but a, a certain number of key ingredients are either combined with others or there's various dose forms. And that combination can, have great, can make for great differences in effect. You can have a drug that's intended for, um, uh, is, is, has one intention, for example, depression, and it, it may be used in different ways uh, for bulimia, for instance, in a different strength. Prozac is like that. Prozac is, is for depression, but when you get the strength way up, it's actually suitable for bulimic treatment. But you have to have a very high strength. So in that case, you have to look at drugs in terms of strength. But what these charts show you is that of all the data available, now that we have it in the graph, we're able to say for the month beginning in August, and these these numbers are regenerated and all those schemes are regenerated on the first Monday of every month. So first, from the first Monday in August, there were 2,291 ingredient or ingredient combinations used to index um, currently prescribable drugs in the United States. And when we start adding doses and forms, the numbers go up. And what that leads to, if you start looking at these indexes, Here's another view of the same information. You start seeing the same number I just talked about. We've broken it into four different indexes. So you can look at drugs according to drugs with a single ingredient and many forms, which are in many cases the most interesting, are many ingredients, one form. Um, so we can basically reload and look at different drugs of different ways. And you can see one interesting thing in the side here. Let me just point this out. Let me go back to forms because I think the numbers will be bigger. Where's my mouse not working? So if we go back to forms, you'll see right on the, on the right-hand side here, this gives you the number of things that the FDA has, the number of identifiers and distinct labels the FDA has for this particular drug's chewable tablet. Now, the uh, NIH only has one identifier. The FDA has 41 different identifiers. And so there's a lot of reduction that goes on as we bring all the information together. And different information here in these columns is from different schemes. For example, the availability is actually from the FDA Orange Book. You don't know if something is available under one availability or another unless you look in there. We know when a drug was approved because of the Orange Book. 
The SPLs, these structured human readable labels, we actually pick out one of them as the best among all the candidates. And that's why you see daily med one of something. And then you see the different forms available. That actually comes from Oryx norm. The basic ingredient comes from Oryx norm. The drug classes, they come from NDFRT. So different information from different schemes, but because they were all brought in to RDF, they can actually be presented in a coherent fashion. Now, if we went into one of these in detail, let's look at Nexium, which is a fairly common drug, Isomeprazole. Now, it's available as a prescription drug, and relatively recently, it was also available over the counter. Um, AstraZeneca was the first um, applicant and labeler um, that produced this particular drug. The oldest current product, that means the oldest product continuously in the market is from 2001. And the different licenses, this is basically the licenses that the FDA gives to this drug. An NDA, a new drug application, is for an original drug. So if a drug's still in patent, often it'll still have only an NDA. If it suddenly is available as a generic, it will also have an ANDA, which is an abbreviated application. And that information is available in the orange book. And now you see four different types of signature, if you like, for this drug. Here's Oryx Norm signature, delayed release capsule isomeprazole. The orange book actually has two. Um, and then you see how the diff different, this is moieties. These are the uh, actually active ingredients. This is the salt in, in SPLs. You come down here and you start seeing these are all of the uh, FDA products indexed for by this Oryx Norm 20 milligram, you can see that different labelers make it available, Pfizer and AstraZeneca make it available under different uh, licenses. You'll see there's one generic product that was made available by Teva. And then relabelers, these are people who are licensed by the primary license holder or the generic license holder to actually produce uh, products that are often sold in doctor's offices and other places. So you'll see people like Remedy Repack and Cardinal Health. And if you buy a generic, you might be buying something made by them or simply relabeled or repackaged by them. And they also have uh, SPL information out there that because we've integrated the data, we're able to bring it all together. And if we go down, you also have information about the applications, who made the application, when was it approved by the FDA. You have patent information about whose patent it is and why they got that particular patent. Um, when you get into the drug itself, you get into what's called, what is the master drug the uh, um, uh, FDA uses for testing. So in this particular case, it actually uses the 40 milligram version when it's making assertions about the clinical effects of a particular drug. And you can see that it distinguishes the over-the-counter and prescription versions, even though actually chemically they're the same. Then the various patents are listed again, including which, which of the applications references different patents. And you can also see if a patent happens to be also referenced by other drugs or other forms of the same drug. So some of o Omeprazole's uh, dose forms also reference the same patent. The oral suspension visa meprazole also references this as well as the delayed release tablet. Um, and this basically lets you dance around the different drugs and see who's using patents for what. And then in the inside, what are called these structural product labels, you get to see which labels are produced by which uh, applicant or labeler, and you see what they're doing. In this case, um, clinical Solutions Wholesale is simply a relabeler and a repackager. They don't actually manufacture the drug themselves. All of this information that we were just looking at very quickly, uh, none of it is available in one scheme. You actually have to integrate the schemes together in order to get this more comprehensive view of who produces the drug, what forms are available, are they available over the counter or not? Are they available only as a prescription? Are they available as a generic? In other words, are they cheaper? Can you get a non-branded cheaper form or are they only available as a brand? How long is a patent going to last for? Who has the patent? All of that comes from different places. And the reason we've been able to put a coherent picture together of isomeprazole like this goes right back to the first tab, which is by taking the various data sets and bringing them into this coherent RDF form. We can then very readily query the Jenna triple store to produce these documents that give us that one integrated, 
coherent look. And I must say, David, I probably spoke faster than I intended, but that is the end-to-end -end view I wanted to present. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Connor. Um, so let's now go to Q&A. And as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just email it to me. I'm uh, checking my email right now, and we will see what questions we have. Uh, let's see. I have... So here's... Uh, okay, our first question was about... Um, uh, it says, examples looked like JSON. Is it possible to represent JSON data in RDF? Um, yes. That's the RDF, people often use RDF as if it's, a, as you well know, David, as if it's a data format. It's not a data format. It is saying that you have things that point to other things and they also have li literal properties. That's all it's saying. And then you can serialize it in various concrete forms. And one of the serializations, I think we looked at it here, is JSON. Now, the specific JSON, it's a particular way of using JSON, is called JSON-LD, JSON-linked data, because what, it, what it's trying to do is support two things that are often overlooked in JSON. One is that you can namespace properties. So you're trying to definitively, uh, you're trying to have a fixed definition of what a certain field in the JSON means, and you can define that somewhere. And secondly, that it it wants to make sure that you clearly distinguish between strings or numbers or whatever, literals in other words, and pointers. And that's often something that's ambiguous. You could have a field that happens to just have some numeric ID. Is that a number or is that an identifier of something? Does it point to something? That's something that you want to define in the JSON version of your RDF because you don't want to lose nuance that RDF says you should have. So of course, you can, you can take, you can, represent anything that you have in RDF and JSON. If you take generic JSON and you want to turn it into RDF, yes, but what you're going to do there is you're going to say, okay, well, which of my fields are actually pointers? Which of my fields are dates? Which of my fields are numbers, uh, booleans? They're, the dates, booleans, and all pretty much fall out, but certainly the pointers are things you're going to want to call out. And you're going to make something called a context, if you look at the JSON-LD standard, where you define what your different fields mean. So you can overlay with the definition the meaning meaning on your JSON. And then you can run it through generic JSON-LD tools that will actually produce other RDF serializations for you. And that's why we actually picked JSON, JSON-LD specifically, as our RDF serialization. Great. Thank you, Connor. And next question is, how do you identify the mappings between different schemes? OK, by, by default right now, we take the maps that are, and you'll see that if you download these. So you, it's not that there's anything hidden here. It's on the open Git. You can download and see it yourself. We actually take the maps that are in the different schemes themselves. So for example, when you take Oryx norm, it comes with maps to the NDCs. Um, we had to do our own maps between the FDA orange book and Oryx norm because those are not actually in the schemes themselves. Um, the SPL data, here's an example actually when you model of uh, when we import it in, we turn things that were originally just looked like uh, strings, and we said actually they're pointers, they're identifiers. Um, in the uh, FDA Orange book, they have an identifier for an application, one of these NDAs, to say that this, that AstraZeneca uh, uh, asked to be able to sell this drug, and here's the application identifier, and that application was released at a certain time to this party, and it's for this drug. Those things in the source data are just strings, and we just say, well, actually, that's an identifier. And in RDF terms, when you have an identifier, you now have a thing that's a typed thing, and now other things can compare, can refer to it. And it happens that in the SPL data, 
the FDA and DCs, they also refer to the original application of a drug. So now we have a, a pointer, if you like, that goes from the SPL data to the Orange Book data. Now those pointers are far from being clear as pointers when you look at the original source forms, but once you bring them into RDF and make as many things, make those identifiers as clear as possible, those references are now clear. So that's the second way matching occurs, which is simply exposing things as identifiers and quote unquote magically, now you have pointers between schemes. So two different ways. Well, three, sorry, I, I did gloss over. We did actually do some ingredient based matching so that we could do more orange book matches then would naturally fall out from the source schemes. But in general, they're either match sets that come along with the schemes or by exposing identifiers, we get those pathways for free. Let's see, next question is, uh, how did you convert the source data into RDF? Okay, and um, that is a, as you might imagine, because the different forms, whether it's RRFs or RF2s or CSVs, they're all, um, they're all, they have their own quirks. We have a separate framework, um, which is written in Python, which parses these different forms and produces, um, it, it actually then reduces it into one big graph and then the graphs are serialized into JSON-LD. So that's the pathway to get these schemes that you see on the GitHub. And that, pa that is a framework, it literally runs in big batch jobs, so it literally goes off to these websites and searches every morning to see if there's a new, uh, a new uh, version of it of a scheme because by the way unlike the nih a lot of the other people don't release their stuff on a regular schedule they might just put it up on a thursday or a monday and wait six weeks when they say that they're monthly so this batch job basically checks downloads and then sets the scheme going one of the awkward things about it in practice of course is that for some of the more edgy uh, schemes uh, th these are often just dumps from applications that are bespoke and they can arbitrarily change things. So sometimes the maker will fail and we'll have to go fix it. So there's a day's delay and when we actually get all the data together, that's just the practicality of the fact that there are too many people out there producing too much overlapping data, but where we have to live in the world that's real. Right, yep. Um, so let me jump to this question then. Uh, what RDF tools did you use to build drug docs? I said currently literally the the drug docs were built if you go to the simple knowledge service which is an open git and download that our beginning process to build drug docs is literally to git clone this or git update because the um this this is updated first by the makers and importers and then um they're there's it's Python as well. There's various Python that runs that uh, does a lot of Sparkle queries uh, with a lot of pathway walking, does graph reductions, and there's a bunch of map reducers that walk and reduce various things, um, exclude certain things as inconsistencies, by the way. I didn't get into that. The Orange Book has lots of inconsistencies. So you have to be, we're very conservative in what we say when are things the same or not? And we have a big then log file that shows the various choices we've made if we've had to make explicit choices. But the pipeline is literally what you look at. Um, let me go to this here. If you go to home, the pipeline is this. If you look here on your screen, I don't know if you can, you can probably see David's and not mine then. Can you see mine anymore, David? Yeah, when I'm not talking, we, we do see yours, I believe. Okay. Um, well, either way, if you can imagine from before the uh, knowledge service on the left-hand side, uh, to the left of the knowledge service nominally is, are these makers that create these schemes. The knowledge service, the schemes are loaded into it, and then the drug drop maker actually does a walk using Sparkle on the knowledge service and actually produces the drug docs, which is also a set of JSON-LD, by the way. And then there's another batch job that produces the website. On the on the out of that JSON LD, so it's a big long pipeline is the best way to look at it, and most of it's available in the open. Great. Um, next question: Is there a way to aggregate drugs into a view of drug classes? ATC and MDFRT contain drug classes. 
how do you group drugs into each drug class? Okay, um, I can, well, if you can see my screen, can you see my screen now? If you could see my screen, if you go to the index tab on the Drug Docs website, um, you'll see that the second or the third column is classes. And those are the NDFRT classes. Um, and that simply is, is pulled in. There's two routes to that. One route is in NDFRT itself, and one route is actually taking the classes by Unicode, which are shipped with the SPLs. And they're also NDFRT classes. So there's two routes to get to the classes. Um, and right now we're using them as classes for ingredients. And then if obviously an ingredient is in a drug or compounded in a drug, well, then the drug belongs to that class as well. What, um, and you could go further and say, give me an example of all the drugs in this class. The source data is all there. So that's very easy to do. You simply look at whoever is in that class. So you're absolutely right. The questioner wrote that. The NDFRT has classes there. As I said, it actually has two sets. It has VA classes. It has, and you'll see that if you go to schemes.caregraph.info and you can browse around the NDFRT scheme, the same one that's on the Git, you'll see that there are VA classes and FDA classes. Right now, we're not choosing the WHO's classes, but it is an issue for us for October to see how those classes compare to the NDFRT classes because it's all available. Okay. And Let's see, the next question is, how much effort was needed to convert the source data to RDF? What ontologies are you using to un underpin this? Is well, the, the, basic, the, basic, <laughs> yeah, the basic ontology is SCOS. So the basic idea was, let's say we have scheme X, and it's for I don't know. Let's say it's not even for medical stuff. You know, you're trying to describe automobiles and you have a preferred name for a car and you've alternative names um, you have it is of type car maybe it's an off-road vehicle you have the notion that it um, so it's a, has a broader top you've the notion it's it's from a certain manufacturer so the manufacturer will also have a resource um, it may have certain model years that's also that specific data so all of that stuff is rep the basic stuff, the basic framework of what you're representing is available in SCOS, which is which lays down that you have a type of thing called a concept, it belongs to a scheme, it has a preferred name, alternative labels, it has relationships to other concepts, it may match concepts in different schemes. That's all available from SCOS, there's your base ontology. We added a few things to that, like this notion of broader top that lets us refer back to top concepts. Um, and also code, because they were, that was something that came up very much, that codes might be different than the ID. Um, UMLS CUI, we just put in rather than may, uh, formally define UMLS as a scheme, because we don't think it merits it. So those were things we simply added into the mix. And then all the other properties are specific to that scheme. So Oryx norm has a, prop, has a predicate called ingredient in form of um, snow, um, snow med has various properties of its own. Um, that come in the scheme itself. And all we're basically doing there is taking whatever properties in the scheme and we put it into the namespace of that particular scheme. So there's a SNOMED ontology, an Oryx norm ontology, a Meth SPL ontology for their specific properties. One of the key things we do to make it easy for walking is these are directed graphs, these are DAGs. So we, we remove symmetric properties. There's only one path through the graph. So for example, if you had something like and a relationship from one thing to another, like ingredient, well, father and son stuff. So, you know, is fa father of, has son, we would only represent one of those directions. We would basically not have both directions in the graph. So we do suppress one side of symmetric relations. So the graph is totally directed. That's one of the things we do do. Great. Um, so another question here. Sorry. How much effort was it to do? It depends to the convert the source data to RDF. It depends on the scheme, uh, um, you know, and it, it, for example, you know, if you put aside just the syntax handling and you put aside stuff like the scheme is buggy or they go and change the columns on you every month, which Unicodes do, um, 
th that's one issue. The, but if you put that aside and you just look at content, some of them are very nice because they are, no, Oryx norm is nicely structured. They are normalized. Some of them are not. They're just long flat lists and you effectively have to go and extract different types yourself and arrange them as quote unquote they should be. Some of them, it's very clear what's an identifier. In some cases, you have to go and define that. So there's an analysis phase. The other thing that we found was that where they're not very well structured, the structure you end up with in the end is best formed by use. So for example, we've evolved our orange book representation quite a lot as we've tried to produce drug docs. So our initial was very flat. And I think actually the one on the website is still pretty flat. But the, um, the nuance we needed when we went and produced drug docs during the pipeline, we had to do more nuanced stuff. That will feed back into the schema representation because we don't want the, the downstream parts of the pipeline to be too complicated. So we tend to rearrange the schemes to suit the use. And that's in practice what everyone does. There's no optimal framing of data that suits every application purpose. You may, for example, not want a DAG if you are doing a website with MongoDB, we're actually going to have something about this next month where we're going to quote unquote fatten up the data to put more relationships in because really to have a practical MongoDB representation, you do want things like symmetric properties. Um, so it depends on the medium you're going to use as to what you'll end up with. I suppose long and the short answer is it's an iterative process and having a usage, a concrete use for it, like drug docs, has been very useful to us because it's meant that the schemes we've produced haven't just been academic and we don't have to wonder whether they're useful. Okay, next question. Uh, were there any enhancements made to the original data sources? For example, SPL slash daily med has a mm -hmm. lot of semi-structured data in HTML tables that could yes. be useful. For example, summaries of adverse events in trials. Uh, if it was properly structured and harmonized. Mm -hmm. Okay. The the what well, we do with that that's a sep we have a separate framework for parsing um, the uh, non structured parts of the SPLs. Um, that's not actually out on the drug doc site, um, but it builds on top of the drug docs. And there, for example, we can extract as best we can uh, the summary data for example of a drug which may be available in a patient insert section or a med guide section or indications and usage section and you have this kind of fallback approach where you're trying to get as consumer friendly as a set of information as you can certain SPLs have it certain don't um, what we do in drug docs and you'll see is we have this notion of a master SPL which is the SPL we think is the most comprehensive based on various metrics, but that's a guidance. And then that's the SPL we actually do more NLP on, which is, I think, what the question is alluding to. You're absolutely right. Various people have done different approaches on this. Right now, NDFRT, for example, there's three flavors of NDFRT in Oryx Norm. The Oryx Norm release, I don't mean in the scheme. And those flavors all reflect slightly different approaches to parsing those structured sections. Um, because the first approach that they had, their default was maybe a little too uh, flabby and it tended to assign, for example, far too many side effects to things. Um, and sometimes the SPLs do themselves. So th we're getting part of that data now from what they've put into NDFRT, and we have that in the drug docs. But without me rambling too much, we're also looking at doing that ourselves. That will mean we'll have to support our, our put out our own scheme effectively. We'll do it according to the same SCOS modeling as, as we've approached other things. And we'll make it very, very clear in the provenance exactly what sections we got all the data from, which is something that most of these reductions don't do now. So we're going to be very big into provenance when we do more SPL parsing. OK, uh, let's see. Last question. What if different data sources have different information about a drug? For example, if one data source contains dosage information and another doesn't, mm -hmm. what happens when you combine them? Does your normalized schema contain that information? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, is the normalized schema the union or the intersection of the source schemas? Um, well, it, it's both a reduction and, and a union. Um, and why I say that, so think of the union. Your example, the example of the questioner was, um, union because one scheme has dose forms and the other doesn't. So for example, orange book 
has application information and Oryx norm doesn't. But Orange Book has, uh, does have strength and dose form information, which Oryx norm does as well. So if you like, they overlap and they are, there's a redundancy there. Um, but there's also distinct things you can take in from Orange Book. So one of your choices is, well, what are you going to make? Where do they overlap? Who's your master? Who do you think is the one you want to go to? So we decided right off that we would use Oryx norm as the master index, not Orange Book, which means that when Orange Book disagrees or has more or less nuance, we're effectively relying on Oryx norm. I'll give you a concrete example of that. Isomeprazole again that I was showing you. Uh, Oryx norm doesn't take salts into account. So if you have isomeprazole strontium and isomeprazole magnesium, Oryx norm treats those as the same drug. Orange book doesn't. You actually need a different application for those because it takes salts into account. So the normalization of Oryx norm, which is used for prescribing in the United States, actually merges together or mushes together things that are distinguished in the, by the FDA when they license and do trials on drugs. Um, just by its nature, because it decided right off they wouldn't take salts. I think they have one case they do, but generally they don't take salts into account. Because we're going with Oryx norm, we mush them together too. However, you can see in the drug doc, and you can browse that online, if you look at delayed release isomeprazole, you'll see it. Um, you'll see strontium in there. It actually means then that it appears like there's two active uh, applications for this one drug. And it looks like uh, FDA, that the orange book is, is wrong, that it has bugs, which it does have in other places. But in fact, it's right. It's just its nuance is different. So I suppose what I'm saying is you have to be upfront as to which one you're going to choose as the master and n understand the implications of that because their nuance can be different. Frankly, the easiest case is when there's only information like class information from NDFRT. It's not an Oryx norm. That's easy because you union them. The hard thing are dilemmas like what happens when schemes clash, who are you going to pick? And then you have to be explicit in what your reduction is doing. Okay. Uh, next question. Many people in the semantic web space turn to OWL for its ability to do inferences, for example. Yeah. Did uh -huh. you consider OWL, and if so, why did you choose SCOS? Okay, two, two reasons. Um, let me step back a bit. One of the issues with OWL, and maybe David will disagree with me on this, but I, I've played with these two, is to a degree it presumes a, a very well-tended knowledge scheme. Not to a degree, it does assume it. It means that you've, you've sit, sat down and you've produced at the base before inference takes place, uh, correct definitions so that inference is then on top of those. Now, just the example I just gave in the previous uh, to the previous answer, which showed that the schemes we're dealing with, the raw data we're dealing with is buggy, or at least overlaps or differs in nuance. And we considered that it would be better to use SCOS, which is explicitly called out as a looser way to represent things, um, so that we could nuance for explicit reduction by us. So we're choosing, we're not choosing some automatic rule engine, we're choosing the path of reduction. And we're also having to make those choices like, will we take salt into account or not ourselves? And then actually, once you've got the representation, the number of rules processed is relatively small. So SCOS fit the level of quality of the underlying data available to us. I think you have a much higher quality threshold if you want to make OWL your ultimate pipeline and engine. And we just, we're not the original producers of this data, so we have to put up with what we have, and SCOS is ideal for that. SCOS is very good for real world concepts. I think that's a great characterization, uh, Connor. Thank you for that. Uh, that, I believe, is our last question. So thank you very much, uh, Connor, for, for talking to us. Uh, thanks to our audience for joining us. And if you're interested in future Yosemite Project webinars, visit yosemiteproject.org and join our email list. It's a low volume list, basically just for announcements of upcoming events and things. Thank you very much to all of you and goodbye. Goodbye.